Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today, a uh, workshop from us, Silicon Roundabout. And uh, before introducing the, the guest speaker today, I uh, just want to give a quick intro about uh, what are we here for and who we are, if you don't know us already. So Silicon Roundabout is a tech meetup community, the largest in Europe, and we've been running events for startups, from startups and engineers. And we've been doing this since 2011. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this without your support. Uh, our objective is to promote tech and innovation uh, across uh, London, the UK, uh, and we welcome everyone, uh, no matter what uh, skill level of background, as long as you're passionate about startup, you're building a startup either actually on the tools or as a founder yourself. So one of the things we try to do is to provide you with valuable tools to grow your startup and to hopefully increase your uh, success rate as a, as a founder, which we all know is a, is a hard uh, and difficult job. So today I'm joined here by our community manager, Rita, and by our guest uh, speaker, Nana Parif, co-founder of Tectonic London, uh, who actually interviewed me some time ago and uh, we found great synergies because he's very knowledgeable about, about the one main issue that we see time and time again, uh, hundreds of startups from our community getting stuck with, uh, which is their customer uh, acquisition, understanding their customer and making sure that they can uh, successfully grow uh, their, uh, their business in a way that ultimately is, satisfies their customer. Uh, many people stress a lot about product, especially in tech. I'm an engineer myself, so I fully understand that. Uh, but we literally see all, over and over again people that focus too much. I've got this big solution. Forget it all about the customer. So, Nana, you want to take the stage and tell us all how we can avoid falling into this trap uh, and build successful startups? Definitely, definitely. No, thank you very much for, for having me in. Uh, nice to, to meet everyone on the call. Um, I do have some slides that I'm going to go through. I just need to be able to share my my screen. I don't know if uh, Rita or Francesca can help me with that because it's currently disabled. Sure, of course. Uh, by the way, whilst I'm enabling you, uh, let me remind everyone there is a Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, so as uh, Nana goes along, feel free to go there uh, down in uh, the bar you see at the bottom. There is a Q&A. Click there submit your question uh, and then towards the end, uh, I mean, if there is anything that Nana wants to pick up, he'll happily answer. Otherwise we, we have space at the Oh, has he frozen? Yeah, I think he's just having a small internet glitch. Um, okay, that's cool. I can, I can crack on. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take questions if they're in the Q&A. Or, um, or afterwards. But yeah, this talk is um, all about how to acquire the right customers for your startup, focus on the right. Um, and in terms of the outcomes of what I'm going to be talking about today, we want to be able to help you recognize what your assumptions are about your customer. Also how to do what we call customer discovery in real life. There's a lot of theory behind it, but how do we actually turn it into practical terms for you to be able to do yourself, and then also communicate some cost-effective customer acquisition strategies. It's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're a startup. So what we wanna do is promote some of these ideas. So who is this for? Well, it's for people that might have an idea, but they're trying to figure out who their customers are and what problems do they actually have. Also for people who have a product, but have very few or early customers, but not ideal customers yet. Or it could be for people who, are, who already have paying customers and they're trying to figure out what the main customer profile is so they can go and scale. So I'll tell you a little bit about my company, Tectonic, and we help other companies understand the true needs of their customers so they can make better products and services. And the way we do that is through hyper-targeted customer research. So that could be customer interviews, basically finding your target customer and locating them in the real world, you can interview them yourself. It could be through surveys, which we do in 46 countries, or it could be looking at the data that you have, 
and providing insights that you can make those decisions for yourself. And we've got insights from thousands of employees in lots of different companies, but we also work with a lot of startups and early stage companies as well. And you may have heard of the build, measure, learn loop. Um, well, what we're advocates of are the learn, build, measure loop. So focus on understanding your customers first, then potentially building the product or focusing on new features in the product and then measuring after that. So I'm gonna talk about uh, customer discovery, which you may have heard of, but there's this customer development framework or model. And the whole idea is that you're trying to figure out if your customers really experience the problem in the way that you understand them to, but also lots of different other assumptions that you may have about them. And you're effectively a detective, right? You're effectively on the search to be able to identify who those customers are before you then start to try and identify lots of them in different ways and then scale into the customer creation phase and then into the company building phase. So we're right here at this early stage of customer discovery and customer validation. So some of the things that I've experienced previously when I've had different startups before is some of you may be skipping some of the steps and going straight to the customer creation space before actually doing the customer discovery and customer validation, which may be why you might be finding it an issue to find some of these customers. So what we really wanna do is find the customers that they experience the problem, they experience it regularly, they also recognize that they have the problem, they're not in the dark, they're not in denial, they know they have the problem. They're currently experiencing that problem it has a negative impact to them reaching their desired outcome. You don't need to convince them that the problem actually exists. That's one of the biggest mistakes that we make. We have to try and convince people that they have a problem. We don't want to do that. They're trying to solve the problem today through what we call existing alternatives, if you're aware of the Lean Canvas. But ideally, they're already spending money and time trying to solve that problem today. Those are the people that we're really looking for. So I'm going to go into some of the areas around real life customer discovery, focusing on the practice, not the theory. We want it to work for you in real life. If this is something you go and do to try and acquire new customers. And we're just trying to get enough information for you to learn to, for you to learn and make critical decisions about your MVPs, your marketing, your business strategy, whatever that might be. So first of all, the whole concept and idea around customer assumptions. We have to realize that we are making assumptions about our customers is very normal. Uh, we're not going to pretend that we're not doing that, but we have to recognize an assumption is effectively a best guess until we have the evidence to suggest that it's been validated, invalidated or partially validated. So some of these assumptions you might have about your own customers, you may assume that my target customer is experiencing the problem on a daily basis. You may go and find when you validate it, that they're actually experiencing it on a weekly basis or an hourly basis. But you might have an assumption going into that process. You also might assume that your target customers are buying products and services and they're trying to solve the problem today. You may assume that your customers are educated enough in the problem. Sometimes, you know, if you take a, a complex um, situation or a complex theory, you may assume that they understand it to the level that you need them to, to be able to go ahead and become a customer but it might be the case that they don't and they need to actually understand the problem a bit more or the situation a bit more. You might assume that your target customers can't afford to buy your product or sorry, can afford to buy your product. And you might assume that they're best reached on Instagram or they could be best reached on another channel. These are assumptions that we need to really have upfront. And we need to be honest with ourselves about the assumptions that we have about our customers. As founders, it's really, really difficult to sometimes kind of take that lens off and be really objective. But it, as long as you are objective about the assumptions that you have, you can go away and you can find the answers to them and validate, what, validate as to whether they are true or not. So we write them down and the aim is to prioritize the top three to five assumptions that you might have. And you wanna do this by thinking about the ones that are most critical to your business. And often the ones that are most critical to your business are the ones that are related to problem recognition. 
So those kind of ones I talked about earlier, do they recognize the problem? Are they experiencing the problem, etc.? So we've got the assumptions down, then we need to go and create customer profiles, or actionable customer profiles, which I just mentioned. So a customer profile is a humanized view of your target customer, and it will allow you to create testable ideas. So obviously we want documentation to you know, anchor us, but ideally having the customer profile, it's not there to sit in a document and just never be you know, looked at again. The idea is to have the profile so you can actually go and find some of these people in real life, real life and test some of the assumptions that you have. And a good customer profile when you're starting out really concentrates on three particular areas. Those areas being your characteristics of your customer, the traits a customer may have and the behaviors that they exhibit. So if we think about characteristics, these are things that generally are kind of fixed. They don't change uh, very much. So it could be age, location, educational attainment. If it's B2B, the role title of the person in the industry, the industry itself, these are all characteristics of your potential target customer. And then you've got traits. So traits are qualities that due to the nature of your customer or your target customer, they're more likely to possess. So for example, a millennial may be more inclined to share their personal life on social media. Again, these are assumptions, but you need to note them down. And then finally, the most important one, these are the behaviors. So these are the things that your customers that you assume are actually doing. So. Examples could be you assume they go to the gym twice a week if it's in the fitness space or if it's in the B2B space and it's a productivity product, you might assume that they are having team meetings once a month. These are the things that you put down to try and qualify whether these are real customers in real life. And then once you've written down all those characteristics, traits and behaviors, the goal is to choose the top three to five characteristics, traits and behaviors of your customer that are the most important and the most defining, so you can go and find them in the real world because we're gonna go and speak to them. We're not gonna just sit in the building and you know, assume that these are the things and then create marketing campaigns to find them. We're actually gonna go and speak to them. So here's an example of a criteria that you may put down just to go and identify your target customer. So in the B2B space, it could be a business, HR business partner, you know, maybe one of the key characteristics is that they hold a budget or they can authorize product purchases. Um, they may have to have teams of 200 to 500 people and they may need to be accountable for employee performance. Um, we've got no focus on gender or age, it doesn't matter in this context, but we think they need to be in their role for at least once a year. So these are the things that you can note down and prioritize because we're gonna go and find them. So when we go and find our target customers to uh, speak to, it's really key to remember we're not trying to sell to them and we're not trying to get their ideas on what functionality my product or my potential products should have. That's not the goal. The goal is to find them and understand their experiences and speak to them objectively. However, we do know that it is a challenge or it can be a challenge to find your target customers. So where are some of the places that they could be in B2B world or B2C world? Well, for example, they are likely or possibly in your own network. And when I say your own network, I don't mean you know, necessarily one removed from you. You know, Some of you on this call right now might be potential target customers of each other. Um, it's about trying to find creative ways to leverage your network to be able to see if you can find those people that fit that customer criteria. For you to go and speak to. If you're in B2B, LinkedIn is a really, really great tool. I think the key thing here though is if you are looking for a particular role type, um, you know, you have to narrow it down in terms of industry likely, but also you will get ignored. That's part of the game. It's very, very likely. It's very, very possible. You can also obviously do it through emails, um, cold emailing. Again, you will be ignored, but there are techniques to be able to help you do that. You can go through your current customers. If you already have customers or advocates, there are gonna be ways for you to go through them to potentially find people that fit your criteria. 
and the obvious ones, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, there are going to be groups or people talking about certain things that allow you to identify them as well. Beforehand, we had in-person events, obviously COVID dependent, but then you've got those plus professional bodies, really great in the B2B space as well. We find a lot of people who fit certain criteria by actually going to these professional bodies and seeing if they're going to be able to connect us to those within their network. Then you've got online groups like meetups, Slack groups. There are some really specific Slack groups around certain areas, for example, in development, that would be a good example. Survey tool audiences like um, uh, so, um, Typeform, SurveyMonkey, and also obviously Tectonic, we, we do that as well. So then how do you go about approaching your target customers? You found them, you know where they are, now you need to actually go and approach them. As I kind of mentioned before, it's about approaching them to get insights, not to convince them of your solution or that you're trying to sell to them. That's not the point. We want to ask for advice. We want to understand their experiences and we want to make it a tailored effort to get their time. You want to make sure they know that you're, you want to speak to them specifically. So you want to make them feel special. You want to make them feel important. And when you're using your own network, try and get introductions directly through your contacts. So sometimes someone may know someone that might be of use to you uh, when you're trying to speak to them. They may say to you, oh, um, I'll give you their email address and you can contact them directly. Ideally, you don't want to do that. Ideally, you want them to do the introduction for you because you'll get some kind of social proof and it improves, uh, increases the likelihood of that individual being able to say yes to spending time with you. And as I kind of mentioned before, you will get ignored a lot. Don't worry about it, it's just part of the game. But this is the process that really, really helps to understand the customer and take time doing that. So now we're gonna talk about the questions that you may ask once you actually get in front of them. And one thing we need to know is that as founders, we are biased, it's very, very difficult to remove. It's basically impossible to remove. What you want to do is try and limit that bias as much as possible. And we should acknowledge it, we should recognize it, but we want to control it. And some of the different types of bias that you might come across are, for example, confirmation bias. You may be tempted to ask a question in a way that confirms the assumption that you have. So you might say, oh, wouldn't it be great if this product cost 20 pounds a month? That's not useful. That's confirmation bias and a bad question. Um, question order bias. You may be putting questions in a particular order um, that actually cr creates a system where respondents respond in a particular way. Again, you want to kind of mix up the questions so you're getting discrete answers to those questions. And finally, selection bias. You don't want to just talk to your friends. That's not the point. You want to use some of these techniques on LinkedIn or via email to get to people that you have also no connection with so you can get some real unbiased insight. So how do you go about writing unbiased questions? So you have to be clear and concise. That's an obvious one. But it's really important to not, uh, to not use leading language or phrasing. You don't want to be like, wouldn't it be fantastic if, or didn't you feel really sad about that? You really want to try and avoid those polarizing terms. But also really, really important, you want to ask behavior-based questions rather than belief-based questions. What I mean by that is you want to ask questions that aren't rooted in a potential future, such as, would you pay X or would you go to this place? Because ultimately we've all experienced it. We've been asked to do things and then we say we're going to do it. And then for whatever reason, we don't do it. You don't want to make decisions based on some of that data. So you want to ask questions around the past. You want to ask questions around when was the last time you experienced X problem? Uh, how much did you pay for that? What tools and services are you using? These kind of things are really useful. And you want to start with gener generic questions and then get more specific over time. So just for your awareness, here are some examples of bad questions, questions we don't really want to ask. So as I kind of mentioned, would you pay X amount for Y product or service? Um, would you agree it would be great to do this or have this functionality? What do you think of this idea? That's one of the worst questions you can ask. Um, because again, it's rooted in a potential future and you're basically asking the respondent or the interviewee 
to think about what this idea looks like in their head? And did you not take X action because you thought Y? You may have thought they would go down a particular route. You don't want to kind of put that in their minds either. But some good questions we can ask. So when was the last time you experienced this problem? How much do you spend on a particular problem on a monthly basis? What would you say the biggest challenges in your role are? How often do you experience the problem? And again, what kind of tools and services do you use? So there's a number of questions we can ask, but here are some examples of good questions if you wanna get really strong data to be able to make decisions around when finding the right type of customer. So we got the questions, we got the people, we need to conduct the interviews. So before the interview, it is important to schedule them and not try and get people off the cuff. It seems obvious, but it happens. Interview should last somewhere between 20 to 45 minutes. The longer you go on, the more likely you may approach what we call uh, interviewee fatigue or question fatigue, where they're just not really given the level of answers that you, that you require. We try and keep it to 20 to 45 minutes. Make sure you have their contact details. Make sure you have a look at the questions beforehand. I think it's important to record it as well. You would have to ask for permission, but just record it just for note taking because you might miss some things and set up your note documents as well as so you can take notes during the conversation. So I said it before, start with the broadest questions first. And you spent so much time ideally, you know, really getting some good questions to ask. Try and stick to the script. It can be quite... Um, likely that you'll want to go off piste, but try and focus on the scripted questions because you know that's gonna get you the uniform data. Try and make sure you're in a distraction-free environment, pretty obvious, um, but not always easy. Ask permission if you can record and just remind them who you are and what the subject of the interview is. And you don't want to tell them your idea. You don't wanna tell them why they're there. You actually want to be as vague as possible because you're trying to extract unbiased data. So you might say, um, I'm exploring a new innovation, or um, I'd like to get your hear about your experiences in this area. Try and keep it vague because you're trying to extract the right information. Some of the things not to do. So don't rush to ask your next question. It's not always easy, but try not to. It sounds really bad, but you're not there to be friends with the respondents. You are there to build a good relationship so you can get the answers that you need, but you're not there to be pals. So recognize that you're always there for a reason. Um, don't let your personal opinions affect how you conduct the interview. It's very easy to hear something that you thought would have been the case, but unfortunately it's the opposite. And that may start leading you down a path where you're not as objective. Try and hold back and recognize that it's the amalgamation of the data points from all the interviews that you're doing that gives you the data that you need. Obvious ones, because it helps with that, you know, respecting their time. Don't be late starting and don't cut them off. But obviously we're dealing with people, so it's a gray area. Um, asking unscripted questions, you may find there is something that they say that is really, really interesting and you want to dig a bit deeper down that road. Totally fine to do that. Just be conscious of the question that you're asking to try and avoid bias. You want to try and avoid prompting participants as well. You may expect them to have a certain answer, but sometimes you know it is obvious that they should have said it because of a previous thing that they said. So you can do that, but just be very, very careful. And also moving them along, um, time is of the essence and some people are talkers. Um, so you have to just be delicate with that. So we've basically got to a point now where we've understood who our customer profile is. We've identified the key criteria that could make them our target customer. We've got some questions, we found out who they are, we've actually interviewed them. So now we wanna take that data and help us make decisions because we're gonna use these decisions to figure out how we're gonna go and acquire these customers in real life. So there's a difference between data analytics and insights, it's very nuanced, but data is the information you obviously obtain, the discrete information. Analytics is the discovery of those patterns and trends from the data. And insight is the value obtained from those analytics because the insight is what's gonna allow you to drive your decision-making for your products and your businesses. So we wanna collect data, apply analytics to those data sets, and then interpret the insights that come out of it. So as an example, 
uh, this is an example that we worked on as part of our business. So care homes spend 30K a month on health and safety products and services. We, we found that out through the research that we did. We also found through interrogating the information and the data that we, we obtained that 90% of the time they spend between 600, excuse me, and 800 pounds per product or service from an approved supplier list. So what that tells us is that getting on the approved supplier list from an insights perspective needs to be part of our business strategy if we're gonna get our target customer to buy. There's obviously a lot more around this, but just trying to get you to understand the difference between the data analytics and what the insights can provide. And when you've got all your data, you've interviewed 10, 20, 30 people, whatever the number is, you're not trying to do a kind of PhD level analysis, right? This is about being an entrepreneur or having a product. You're trying to figure out what's the minimum information you need to go and make some critical decisions. What you're looking for are consistent themes in that data. So if you have to, you know, as long as you're interviewing the same profile with that same customer or customer criteria, those prioritized ones, you're looking for themes across them to be able to make certain decisions. So for example, uh, there's a company that had the assumption that their biggest pain point that their target customer has is getting access to therapy. This was before they started building anything. That was their assumption. Through the process, the insight they gathered or gained was that based on the interviews they did, the word access or accessibility meant affordable pricing more than it meant location or quality of therapy or anything else. So now that had that insight, they made a decision to further validate and test an MVP to use cheaper services because price being the key insight as to what accessibility means, but also the solution that they've come up with is to um, find overseas therapists and connect them to people that want talking therapies. So they've come up with a solution to find cheaper therapists. They're now gonna test to see if that works. So now that you've gone through the process, you've done some validation, you've spoken to your customers, you're understanding them a bit better, you've identified which ones are really experiencing the problem, but then you need to figure out how to solve it. Maybe you have to build a product to be able to do that. Um, now you need to get customers for your solution. And I will actually pause there before moving into the customer acquisition part, just to see if there are any questions that have come up. Um, I can't see the chat, but if they're, if they're not, I will I'll definitely carry on. I can confirm that for now, we've got no questions from the audience, but I do have one actually. Um, that uh, so a lot of startups have asked me oh there is one popping up um, so the the question I wanted to ask was I've, well lots of startups have asked us uh, oh but how do I go find customers I'm B2B and I'm very like deep tech which is you know what we focus on also Silicon Roundabout you know mm -hmm. uh, you know how am I going to find the right people I need senior people they're never going to talk to me so mm -hmm. yeah B2B especially high tech products what's your suggestion yeah sure so we um, often do B2B, uh, finding B2B people within our network and those outside. We find LinkedIn to be really useful. So for example, I did not know the global head of innovation at Vodafone Group, but I sent a message, a short message that kind of explained my reason for wanting to connect. And I'm now connected to her and I'm now gonna be able to speak to her. So I think that sometimes we, we do underestimate the work sometimes that has to be put in, but people, uh, people are obviously human, are human and they have, you know, interests, they have connections, they have reasons to be um, doing the work that they're doing. So I would say that as long as you have a role and they may be senior, but likely, you know, if it's most, most of the time you take the CEO or there's the executive suite, they don't actually often buy the services, they have people who, they, who work for them, who are the budget holders and who influence that. And sometimes they are more receptive. So my, my answer to that would be use LinkedIn, use professional networks and what we call, which I'll come on to network influencers, who are the people or the organizations that have access to a number of these people where actually getting one or two or, or 10 isn't gonna be as much of a, a problem. 
that's how I'd answer that question. Hopefully that, that made sense. Oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And now we've got Richard who asks, are you saying you, recom uh, you recommend getting warm intros to customers rather than doing the rounds on your own and speaking to look for potential customers? Um, I'm saying do both. I'm not saying do one or the other. In the context of the presentation that I was just, uh, that I was just doing, if it's in terms of speaking to them, if they are in your own network, you have to, or you are being introduced to them, you just have to caveat that you're not looking for people to tell you you're amazing or that everything is, you know, there's no problem, right? You're there to just get their experiences and be objective in that. But I do think there is a lot of value before you actually enter, you know, the actual sales process, which is where some of the cold outreach may be required. It's actually a really good skill to get people to just, who you don't know, to actually engage with you and you know sit down with you um, over a video call and have and have a chat so i would say that it's important to do both just for those that are in your network where there's a little bit more risk of bias you want to try and avoid um spending too much time there and i'd encourage you to to look into trying to acquire those that you have no connection with at all great and then uh we have how do you find your ideal customers in B2C through customer discovery interviews? Do we try to interview everyone through Facebook? Mm. So not necessarily uh, trying to interview everyone through, through Facebook or any other, any other platform. One good example in the B2C space is that um, it, it might not be, you know, they have a particular role, but they likely have a particular interest, a particular behavior, or they're part of a particular ecosystem. So, um, let's say you have a product in, you know, let's say secondhand clothing, you want to create a marketplace for secondhand clothing. Um, there are different, that's a B2C product, but um, you might have different people within that group. So you may have people who want to buy secondhand clothing because for fashion reasons, you know, some people want to buy it for sustainability reasons. Those who are doing it for fashion reasons, they're going to be likely part of groups, part of, um, you know, whether it's Slack groups, whether it's meetups, whatever that may be, they're going to be there engaging in some form. Similarly with the sustainability groups, they're going to be in places because that's something that's important to them. So uh, I think if you can use Facebook potentially as a medium to get some of these people to speak to you, but ultimately it's about qualifying that criteria and not just saying kind of B2C is for everyone, um, it's around finding those people that you think are most likely to be your target customer based on that minimum criteria. So hopefully that example helped put it into context. I think it definitely would. Uh, and then we've got a last question saying, I'm working on this feature which automates a manual task and looking for people will pay for doing it automatically. Should I put up screening questions on Facebook and then interview everyone? How do I know? people will pay, people say one thing, do another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a few questions there. So in terms of the first part, uh, should you put up a screener, providing that you have, uh, you've kind of done that assumption, understanding, and you have, you know, a few screener questions just to see if they will interview you, I don't think that's a problem. They just have to meet that screener uh, criteria. Um, in terms of interviewing everyone, if you're focusing on you know, some really key assumptions. So you're not trying to, you know, um, understand 10 or 15 or 20 different business assumptions that you have. If you're trying to do two or three, in our experience, if you write the questions well, and they are based on past behavior and not the future, and, you know, they're basically just structured questions, then we find that after 10, 20 interviews, you've got a really, really good idea of whether that individual assumption is true or not for that particular profile. Um, so that's the answer to that second part. And then that third part around um, people saying they would, you know, they might pay for something and they don't. There are some techniques and frameworks that can help you here. So as I talked about focusing on past behavior and not future, you can ask questions like, how, how often have they experienced a problem? What tools and services are they using? Do they, how much do they pay for them? When did they start paying for them? Did they leave any? Why did they leave? Obviously, I'm just putting stuff out there, but actually these questions and the answers to these questions are actually what allows me to frame whether they are likely to pay 50 pound, 100 pound, 200 pounds. 
if I haven't got evidence that they've ever paid or spent money or time equating to 200 pounds as they're trying to fix the problem, it just means I can infer that I'm less likely to be able to charge that. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means I'm less likely to. There's actually a combination of the answers to previous questions based on past behavior that can give you the answer to the price range for your potential product. Hopefully that makes sense as well. Great, I'm sure uh, the audience would appreciate. So yeah, the floor is yours again. Awesome, cool. So we've done some of that early customer discovery work. We've got some people that we think experienced the problem, they've evidenced it, et cetera. But now we need to acquire them to be customers. So you've got a solid understanding, you know, based on the profiles, the answers you've received, you've analyzed the data, all of that good stuff. A really important point is just because you've got a good understanding of your customer and the problem that they're solving, it does, and you have a product in place at this time, potentially, it doesn't mean you're ready to scale customer acquisition yet. That's not the goal at this point. You're really, what we like to, what we like to focus on, depending on what stage you're at as a business, is focus on the first 100 customers. There's quite a, a lot of um, uh, rhetoric on, around the, or on the online about finding your first 100 customers and focusing on them. But here are some of the things that have worked for us in terms of getting the first 100 customers and also what has worked for some of the clients that we've worked with as well. So one of the beautiful things about the customer discovery interview process is that when you find people, they could come, they could turn into early adopters, right? So if they do fit your criteria, they are confirming they have the problem, you have a nice pool of people there, A, to stick to, to build a product with, but also to convert to customers and bring them into your ecosystem because you spent that time and you've built that relationship with them. So that's one cost-effective way to, you know, A, it benefits you doing the customer discovery process because the likelihood is that some of them could be, become potential customers. You can also ask for introductions from the interviewees as well. Those that have verified the problem, but also those that may not have. They may know people that do fit that criteria that are more aligned to what we're trying to do. So you can ask for introductions from those interviewees as well. Network influencers, I kind of mentioned it briefly before, but who are the people who are custodians of your target customers? You know, if I am um, uh, looking for those in user research or those in UX, there are going to be, you know, the Niels Norman group is a very known group. Um, I think it's based in Denmark or somewhere in Scandinavia, um, who are known for writing really good content and creating a, um, uh, oh, sorry, creating a module around networking. different different things they screen for beyond just track record um i think at, at fundamentally we care a lot about just like a gp cares about kind of founder market fit we oh there you go <laughs> um so yeah network influencers so who are those people that um own the relationships with loads of your target customers um and they could be if that's Niels Norman group that I was just talking about, they could be people that are already part of meetups, already part of newsletters, wherever that may be. If you go to the network influencer and actually befriend them, work with them, um, build a relationship with them, they can potentially help you access some of these customers through relationship rather than through paid acquisition. Another way is to go into communities and provide value. So sometimes people go into a community like a Slack group or somewhere online and say, hey, I want this, who can help me? The, the likelihood is that you're gonna get less response to people don't know what, who you are and people don't know if you actually care about adding value to the community. So one of the things you could do is start uh, posting content or write, asking questions or starting to provide value to that community. So when they actually recognize you as someone who cares about providing that value, when you're looking to acquire potential customers, that sell becomes a lot easier. You could also start your own community based on the problems that you've uncovered. So one thing, one of the few things due to tech uh, that's still defensible is the community piece. Someone can build, likely it's someone can build your product. That's, the, that's very likely, but it's really, really difficult to build and retain an engaged community. So one of the things that you can do is build a community and turn some of those people in your community 
into customers as well. This works really, really well in the B2C space, um, providing that you focus on providing really good quality content and base it around the problems that you uncovered in the customer discovery process. Uh, you can create lead magnets linked to problems your customers have. So one of the things that we've done in the past is we know that people find it really difficult to ask the right questions. So what we might do is provide a subset of those questions that they can go and ask to their target customers, and then maybe they get the data back and they're not sure what to do. So being able to create lead magnets based on the information you found from the customer discovery process, you, the likelihood is that you're not gonna create a lead magnet that's not gonna land because you're gonna have had a really good understanding of what your customers need. And create content around the shared problem and build an email list. You know, Emails are still you know, quite valuable in terms of their real estate. Um, it's very important to focus on the content around the problem, as I just said, but that is also a cost-effective way. So there are many, many things you can do. Um, I'll share these slides, but here is a list of some tools to help you with those first 100 customers. So it could be landing pages, you can use Doric, you can use Card, um, newsletters, you know, Substack, ConvertKit, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different things for community tools, payment, we really like Panion, we're huge fans of Panion as well, um, no code tools, et cetera. But you can have a look at this when we, when we share, the, share the deck. Okay, so you've got to a point where you've got your customer discovery, you're, you've really focused on getting those first 100 customers through some of those more cost-effective methods. We didn't really talk about paid ads back then, mainly because we feel that there are more effective things you can do at that early stage to be able to um, get your first customers. But then it's about that customer creation and company building aspect, that scaling aspect. So remember the channel. The reason that's here is we have to remember the customer profile is obviously very important, but the channel is very, very important as well, just as important. Because if you're trying to reach your target customer in a space where they're not, then you're just going to be wasting money. You're just going to be wasting time. And through the customer discovery, through other areas, you are going to be able to choose the appropriate channels. So here are some thoughts you can have around where to find some of these customers from a scaling perspective. So where are they hanging out online or offline en masse? Um, where are they the most vocal about the problem we're trying to solve? Is it Red here? Is it Reddit's a horrible place, right? Is it Reddit? Is it Quora? Um, is it somewhere else? Where are they complaining about the ineffective solutions, the fact that they've been looking for something for so long but can't find it? Where do they celebrate their wins? Um, where do they share their successes? You know, people like to do that. And when they do, are you gonna be able to link onto something there that can potentially grab, um, uh, grab, grab you to be able to turn them into a customer? And just where do they communicate with each other in general? But the idea is you've got your, you've done a lot of that upfront work. You still, you have a really good understanding of your customers. As you try and understand what is working, the idea is to double down on what is working effectively until it doesn't work anymore. Because the likelihood is we have to remember the market is constantly moving. It doesn't mean the thing that works today is always gonna work. So you constantly have to be looking at different acquisition strategies. But uh, some of the things that you could do, so creating relevant, regular and timely content, um, some of the ones that you would already know, targeted SEO, AdWords, you know, social media ads, um, what we call vertical integrations or owning the distribution piece. Are there parts of um, the, the pathway from going from interested uh, customer to purchasing the product? Are there bits in between around the distribution space that would allow you to intercept that to get more customers? But also horizontal integration. So I've been thinking about this personally, you know, is there a way to go into this kind of micro private equity piece where you're not you know, paying millions for a company, but are there small businesses that have acquired a solid business base, you know, they, they link to your customer profile, can you buy them and then actually turn them into other customers? Um, become a platform, become a focus place where people go to to get the information they need and brand that and be a proponent of that incentivize bigger network influencers. Once you've actually got some revenue or maybe you've got some investment, 
is there something that you can do to incentivize bigger network influences? So if you're thinking about universities, for example, um, can we go to UCAS or can we go to, uh, if you're looking for in sustainability, can you go to business in the community that already have relationships with thousands of businesses? Can you become an influencer yourself and use that to, to build on, to, to get more customers? And can you embed your technology into larger organizations for them to become uh, potential customers of your product as well and their customers to become potential, um, potential customers?